everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Bowles. Uh, I'm the Acting Development Planning Manager uh, in the Planning and Regulatory Services Branch. Uh, I'm the manager for the Development Assessment and Development Compliance teams in Ipswich City Council. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I would also like to acknowledge the Mayor, uh, Mayor Harding and councillors uh, who are in attendance today. Thank you for attending. Um, a few housekeeping matters first. Um, the toilets are out the door at the back there to the right. If you continue down the corridor, they're on your right hand side. You'll see them all the time. In the event of an emergency, the fire exits are also in that direction, um, just past the elevator. Uh, we also have some water outside um, and some agendas, um, if you'd like a paper copy of that. So, just a few housekeeping matters there. Uh, please also keep in mind um, COVID social distancing and mask requirements uh, throughout the session today. Um, with the exception being if you're up here on the lectern, um, you're able to remove the mask to, to prevent that. But I would ask you to put it back on when you sit down amongst the, the crowd uh, and maintain the, the seats that are allocated. Um, so that's just the housekeeping matters out of the way. Um, so on to the matter we have today. Um, the Independent Decision Review Panel has been convened to deliver an increase in transparency, community and customer confidence and accuracy in decision making. The, this is the third time the panel has been convened to review an application, but this is the very first time Council has hosted a public hearing under this process. So please, um, um, we ask for your patience if there are technical difficulties throughout. We, this is the first time we've given a go, um, but we are fairly comfortable with the process as it's a similar process to what's used for Council meetings. Um, I am very pleased to see the attendance that we have today. It's, um, it's really to see a crowd. I'm very grateful that our community is engaged in these sort of matters. Um, so the purpose of today's public hearing um, is for the applicant and submitters to uh, address the panel directly on the application, well, the uh, Wanless Landfill and uh, Recycling Centre application. I've got a map up the screen there that shows the general location. Um, but through the agenda, you'll see that there will be more information presented on the application itself, as well as the operation of the panel from the panel members. Uh, I'm sure you've all had an opportunity to review the procedure and the terms of reference, but I'd like to just reiterate that the purpose of the panel is not to make a decision on the application tonight. Um, the application will still be decided by council at a future council meeting. Uh, the purpose of the panel is to review the application and the officer's recommendation and make a report to the general manager uh, prior to the application being presented at a future council meeting. Uh, with those points stated, I'd like to introduce the two uh, independent decision review panel members, uh, Mr. Leo Jensen, a town planner, uh, who is also the chairperson for the meeting, uh, and Mr. Mark Platt, who is a traffic engineer. Thank you both very much for being part of the panel, um, and I'll have to hand that meeting over to you. Thank you very much. On. Yep, okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Anthony. And uh, first and foremost, welcome everyone to this evening's um, review panel process. Um, I'm Leo Jensen, as Anthony said. Uh, I'm an uh, independent uh, planning consultant uh, with a planning and environmental background. And, and Mark, Mark Platts is a traffic and transport engineer and uh, does work all over, all over Queensland, as, as I do with the planning side of things. So thank you uh, for having us this evening. And um, I just would like to just go through a couple of, um, I suppose, a couple of points and then we'll get straight into the presentations this evening. Uh, first of all, as you may see that tonight's agenda is very tight and obviously we're a little bit behind schedule at the moment so we'll try and make that up. For everyone that's been provided an opportunity to uh, present this evening, uh, please keep to the allocated times. I'll provide a two minute tap on the glass or, or a little warning just to give you a heads up that you've got two minutes to go and then at the end of time um, I'd, I'd ask you to please wrap up um, and, and then take a seat uh, just for fairness of other presenters this evening. 
In terms of getting up, if you could please state your name, the organisation, or if you're an individual, who you're representing, or if you're a submitter, uh, just for the benefit of all of attendees and also for the, the live stream this evening, um, uh, that would be appreciated. Any questions this evening? At this stage, I wasn't planning to be open for questions. Mark and I may ask or may not ask questions of presenters, uh, depending on time, but at this point in time, um, there wasn't, there won't be an opportunity to be asking questions from the floor. Um, I, I suppose one is just having respect for one another this evening. All, our, all attendees are asked to just show that respect um, and respect the, the council process of the review panel this evening as well. Again, a warm welcome, um, and uh, let's 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 move forward. So firstly, I'd like to ask the applicants' um, representatives, um, we've got a, a couple here, we've got Jim Sawley, uh, Ben Slack, Mike Ritchie, and Gavin Duane. A, there'll be a couple of presentations that will be lo uh, on via online, which will come up on the screen. So look, just bear with um, the tech, tech technologies this evening. Hopefully it'll all work smoothly. And we'll, thank you. Thanks very much, Leo, Mark, uh, Mayor and Councillors. Can I start by saying uh, apologies for being a bit late. The traffic between Brisbane and here was not good today. So I'm going to be like a traffic cop to try to bring in our three speakers from Sydney. Dean is the applicant for this and owns the land. Mike Ritchie is an environmental specialist. He's in lockdown in Sydney. And uh, Gavin Duane is an economic modelling specialist. So if the man at the back of the room has got us under control, they will come in in sequence. So my job is to control that. And uh, the first speaker will be Dean online. Uh, and Dean is the owner of this piece of land. And the Wanless family have been involved in recycling forever. Are you there, Dean? I am. Can you hear me, Jim? Yes. We're in your hands, Dean. We can, I don't know whether and we can see you. Can we see Dean or not? Oh, that's not a tragedy, Jim. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's can for others to decide, Dean. <laughs> um, well, they're just, uh, we're getting there, I think, are we? Would you like me to commence? Yeah. Are you happy for Dean to commence? Yes, Dean. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Councillors, Executive, Panel, uh, and uh, people who have attended. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I, I appreciate uh, the turnout and the importance that we've placed on this particular development uh, as it deserves to have this sort of attention. Um, Sorry, Dean, like just before you go on, is, can we get the map up of the site for people? Okay. Yes. Are, are, are the slides are the no, slides that's, available, that's Jim? Not, that's not our slide. Is there a slide with has the application clearly there? Oh, okay. Next one. Next one. Next one. Okay, Dean, yes, the map is up now. Fantastic. Thank you. I, I've got it here. So, um, just just a bit of context. Uh, the site initially attracted me uh, as a 1,500 acres of unutilised and derelict land uh, that is well positioned for this type of investment. In my view, there is no greater economical community use for this site uh, that, and what will deliver the same level of rehabilitation and future economic use um, than what we have proposed and that we are committed to. The development of the site We'll see the voids from coal mining rehabilitated and returned to level through a stage filling approach. This will occur over 18 years for the Iron Bark and Lanes pits, which are the two major ones you see in the cent centre of the of the photo. Um, the site itself is well separated from dense residential areas, as you can see, uh, located within the council's identified waste activity area under the TLPI. Uh, all activities we've proposed on the site are located inside of the area and do not extend 
into the identified buffer areas. Uh, the significant testing of the site demonstrates the site remains stable from previous mining activities and as such has the ability to support future industrial uses, which are aligned with the Council's regional industry and business investigation zoning. Uh, another point I'd like to uh, draw your attention to are the, are the neighbouring properties and, and the proximity location. Uh, just a couple, I won't go into them all. A lot of the people are present tonight will be quite aware, uh, but there is uh, the Violia Tea Tree Landfill uh, in the Willowbank Precinct, which we share a, quite a long boundary with. Uh, the New, New Hope Coal Mine, which is just to the north of the rail loop you see across the road from the Willowbank Motocross. And there's also the Queensland Raceway and uh, the Inland Rail. So as you can see, um, we're, we're naturally buffered by a lot of industry and, and uh, extensive use sites. Uh, slide two, please, or the next slide. Thank you. Um, my family and I have been involved in recycling for more than 60 years. Most recently, this site you see on the photo, Sydney Recycling Park at Kemp's Creek in Sydney Southwest is of particular interest to what we're discussing tonight. The operation recycles more than 80% of material that is received on site. Now this is achieved through best available technology, um, as well as targeting waste streams that we are confident we can recycle, which is quite important, um, uh, you know, having the end user in mind. This type of waste that we receive and recycle at the site includes what you'd expect, metals, aggregates, paper, cardboard, e-waste, plastics, green waste, timber, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, recycling's come a long way. The SRP site or Sydney Recycling Park site is located within 50 metres of residential properties. Now, if you, fo if you can see it, and I'm sorry if you can't, just to the, just to the top of the photo, um, we have five houses that line Clifton Avenue, which is the road, and the closest one's 50 metres uh, within 50 metres of our front uh, Weybridge entrance. Now, this initially was quite, you know, it's 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 quite a um, quite quite something to manage. But to date, since we've been running this operation for almost 15 years, we have not had any complaints about the operation, and we provide a, we 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 pride ourselves on having a good working relationship with our closest neighbours and have been doing a lot of work. Um, and always have done a lot of work, um, you know, just in, in site maintenance and, uh, and in constant discussion about what's required and what's expected. Um, yeah, we do a lot of work with the local community, listening, matching community needs with outcomes for the long term, incredibly important to us. Um, you know, as a family business that's been going for 60 years, uh, we, it, it, it's incredibly important that uh, we don't affect other families. Um, next slide, please. Now, we're seeking to replicate the success of SRP, Sydney Recycling Park, at the Ebenezer site and Wanless Recycling Park. As part of the in, intended operation, 90% of the material that we received at the site will be subject to the recycling processes. Now, recycling is at the heart of this project. Uh, and what we're proposing is 27,000 square metres of enclosed buildings for resource recovery activities. With four times that area as hard stand. Now that's the photo, that's the, if you can see it, the image you're looking at, four primary sheds and four secondary sheds. Basically receival, onward processing uh, for sale. Um, now, the processing and recycling are contained within an area at the centre of the site. So when you look at the, the, the overhead of the site, this is in the very heart. And as being a 1,500-acre site, that creates an extensive amount of buffer. Uh, we also understand odour is of particular concern to the residents in the immediate area. To be clear, we are not proposing to receive sewage sludge or carry out any form of composting on site. Traditional, you know, issues with these types of products. In addition to this, any waste streams that contain protressable contents are proposed to be processed on site 
through the fully enclosed buildings. And these are maintained in negative pressure environment that extracts odours out through biofilters. Now the waste area in the landfill will also be covered and limited to a tight surface area. Now to give you an, to give you an understanding, this negative pressure biofilter environment in these massive sheds is, uh, is cap capital expenditure expected to be about $10 million. So it's something we're not taking lightly. And we, we totally understand the community's interest in that. That's the material to start. We are targeting a total start recovery rate of 35%. Sorry. To this. Sorry, Dean. Have we got back online? Can you hear me now? Are you able to hear me? What, no, Dean, you're not coming through. If you don't mind, I might take your last slide and uh, and talk about this slide here. This is the next slide. Can you hear me now? Are you there, Dean? I can hear you. Can yeah, hear no, you. we can't hear you. So I, I think it's important that we emphasise this slide. Uh, there is a very clear commitment here, as Dean has indicated, to recycling. This is not just landfill. His investment is $200 million. That's the sheds, the roads, the networks, the bridge. So he will invest $200 million. In the construction phase, there will be 300 local jobs. In the operational phase, there will be 50 full-time local jobs. So this project is about jobs and investment in Ipswich. The last one there is that there is a 66 hectare part of this application and the adjoining application for a koala habitat. And Dean has committed to that. The part in this site is a part of the approval from the state and the adjoining hectares will be committed to it. So that's the extent of Dean's investment in this. So you can see this is not the normal landfill out here. It's about jobs, capital investment, and recycling. I'm sorry Dean couldn't say the last bit. He would have said it much better than me. Uh, but we're now going to go to our planner. Ben Slack is the guy who's done all the planning, and he will give the planning details of this application. Start there. Uh, my name's uh, Ben Slack. I'm a planning director at Urbis. Uh, I've got around about... Uh, 30 years of uh, planning experience and uh, we're well versed in uh, undertaking applications uh, such as these but you, you can see uh, in front of you that uh, it, it is a large site uh, we have tried to concentrate uh, the major activities within the center of that site and away from you know what we believe to be uh, sensitive uh, land uses you can see that the large parts of the site are buffering those uh, surrounding land uses and in fact uh, large parts of the site will be rehabilitated for environmental um, act, well, environmental uh, and ecological activities. The application itself has been, uh, it, look, it's a complicated application. Uh, we've got numerous sub-consultants, around about 15 to 17 sub-consultants, um, being involved in a wide variety of, uh, of disciplines, whether that be um, yeah, air quality, water quality, whether that be ecological uh, fauna assessments, uh, uh, um, traffic assessments, so a wide variety of, uh, of consultants. Um, we have been undertaking the application, and you'll see that in a, in a second, for you know, nigh on sort of two years. Um, the, the application itself and the, I suppose the details of the application are, are seen behind me. I don't um, want to actually go behind that other than to say there's, there's a reconfiguration uh, application, there's numerous arms of material uh, change of use applications, and then there are importantly, uh, combined with that, there are environmentally relevant activity applications, which we use to control and to mitigate uh, environmental effects. So very, very important uh, to understand that. So we just move over to the uh, to the next slide, please. Okay, I like this slide. Uh, I think it's a very, very powerful slide, and and what it does is is it, is it demonstrates that every uh, ninety percent of every bit of waste that goes onto the site will go through a recycling process. It will go through that shed. And that, uh, that uh, waste will be sorted and up to 45 to 60% of that waste 
will be recycled. The remainder of that waste will go to landfill. And 10% of that waste that goes through the front door will go straight to landfill. So that, that there demonstrates that this is truly is a recycling application and that 90% of the, of the waste going through the front door will go through a recycling process. Next slide, please. So it's been a long journey, uh, lots of consultants, lots of fees, all that type of stuff, and uh, lots of experts. And you know what we've done, and I apologise if, apologise if I'm turning my back to uh, some of the uh, some of the audience. We had a pre-lodgement meeting in September t 2019, and we, we we chatted to council. We consulted the community through uh, workshops, through letterbox drops, through new newsletters, uh, through to uh, November 19. We lodged the application before. Uh, before the end of the year, uh, we we lot, what happened between that time and the 27th of April, um, we got a, an, an information request from both the state and also council. We responded to that on the 27th of April 2020, and from uh, and look, and from the 27th, uh, and then also what we did was then we publicly notified it on May 2020. Now the next timeline is is, is very very important, for a period of a year. We liaised with the state and responded to their issues and worked closely with them to get conditions of approval and an approval from the state, like one year. So we worked very, very closely with the state, with the planning department, with the Department of Environment and Science, with um, Main Roads, Department of Transport, to mitigate all the environmental impacts from the development. We worked with them for one year. And there were numerous information requests and further um, requests for information. And at the end of that time, they gave us an approval for the works and conditions associated with that. So we worked with them for a year with experts in their areas, okay? And it's, it's not a point uh, to be taken lightly. And then um, after that, we find ourselves where we are today, gladly uh, speaking in a public arena to talk about how this development complies with the planning controls and the imp impacts of development can be mitigated from environmental uh, impacts. For the next slide, please. Okay, so I'm a town planner. I understand the town planning rules and controls. Effectively, within Ipswich City Council, because landfill is such a, an important and, in fact, divisive activity within the community, what council has done is they have developed a temporary local planning institute to control the way that landfill is located within the city and to balance its impacts and economic and social impacts. Pretty important. And so what we have done is we've assessed the application, as, as we should, and demonstrated in our mind, without doubt, that the application complies with that temporary local planning instrument. Okay? And the first things there are it actually sits within the area which has been designated very important. We've rehabilitated those areas that require rehabilitation. The filling of the voids does not extend above the, above the lip of those, of those voids other than for to get rid of storm water, to allow storm water to run off at an, at, at an appropriate grade. And the waste activity uses are developed to maintain vegetation and not to have adverse environmental impacts and we've received many conditions from the Department of Environment and Science and work very hard with them to ensure that we comply with those uh, issues and, mitig and mitigating any adverse impacts. And importantly, and one of the key things here and one of the whole reasons for that TLPI was to ensure that the impacts of the development, not only environmental, but from an air quality and from a noise perspective, do not go outside the boundaries of the site and do not exceed limits that are prescribed by the state, okay, very important. And we comply with all those controls set out in the TLPI. Next slide, please. So, council uh, uh, has advised us, they do have some concerns where we sit uh, right now. There's no doubt about that. Uh, those concerns are shown there in a sort of a vignette or a pictorial sort of format to, uh, to make uh, matters a little bit simple. And so, uh, the first one is in uh, koala environmental management. Yes, koalas do at times inhabit the area. We've mapped those areas 
We've worked with the, with, with the Department of Environment and Science. We've um, ma actually, we've actually um, put in three trees to every one that we're removing. So there's a net actual increase in the amount of uh, koala habitat that will be provided through designated environmental corridors. And importantly, um, we are basically uh, providing paths for those to move around areas where there would otherwise be um, impacts. Amenity issue in terms of odour. We provided no uh, odour modelling that demonstrated that we know odour impacts at the boundary of the sites. Through, dis through discussions and condi conditions from Department of Environment and Science, they actually went one step further and, and made us ensure that all protestable waste, which is the stuff that smells, is contained within an airtight shed to ensure that no odour actually is released from that shed. So not only does it not go past the boundary, it doesn't actually go past the bounds of that actual shed. Very important. Uh, the third is uh, amenity issue, noise. Noise modelling has demonstrated that no noise will go at any time of day, day or night, beyond the boundaries of the site. And we've had that conditioned as part of the state government uh, conditions of approval. An important point. Um, I talked about the rehabilitation issues. And then the last one is, is dewatering and groundwater. Importantly, in relation to the current management that relates to the mining voids, if they were to be left as they are at the moment, the water, the groundwater, seeps into those voids and mixes with the, the remnants of the mining activities there at the moment. And we've found that out through the environmental investigations that we're, that we're undertaking. So if it was continued without, without any intervention, in, in accordance with the, the mining approvals, there would be, mining, uh, there would be environmental harm. What we are doing through the application and through the controls and the conditions that have been placed by DES and its uh, state government uh, agencies is to ensure that the lining of those pits en ensures that the water that goes in will be treated and, and, and leave the site in a manner similar to that which it hit the ground. So it's an important point and a net benefit in terms of water quality on the site. Uh, next slide, please. Professor Scanner. So, um, look. Uh, that, that's the end of the, the planning side of things. I think the important thing is I would like to reiterate about the 90% the of, uh, of, of waste going to the site being, uh, being, being actually recycled. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Let's see if we can get our next one out of Sydney. This is Mike Ritchie, who's a recycling environmental consultant, and he's looked at the business case here with the suggestion from the council. Mike, are you there? I am, Jim, thank you. Can you hear me? We can, we just want to see if we can see, see you now. Yes, we can see you. Okay, Mike. Mike. Ritchie, Managing Director of MRA Consulting Group. Uh, we're a group of 40 odd engineers, scientists, lawyers, operating in the recycling space across the country, advising councils, governments around all things waste. And I'm also an ex-commissioner of the Land and Environment Court in New South Wales. So the, we were asked by the applicant to look at the business case for the supply of materials and the processing of it. Uh, we were also asked to look at, could you build this facility just on recycling alone without landfilling? Uh, could, you, could you have a resource recovery park in and of itself without the landfill component? The answer to that is no. We modelled three scenarios, as you can see in this table here, at different tonnages, and you can see all of them where the Wanless site does not include a landfill. There are additional costs of transport and disposal to someone else's landfill that make the proposal for just a pure recycling only facility uneconomic. It's only with the landfill that the proposal become, get, delivers you a return on capital. So the two parts of the project being the recycling and the landfilling really have to travel together. And only when the landfill levy in New South Wales rises more or less to, to near the New South Wales, Victoria and South Australian levies would recycling of this scale become economically viable. So to get this kind of recycling happening in South East Queensland today, it, it needs to be attached to a landfill asset as well. Next slide, please. The, this site and the recycling that was proposed for this site 
is a massive boost to recycling in Queensland. It, this project alone would increase the recycling rate in Queensland by 4.1% and contribute significantly to the state government's target of 90% diversion by 2050. So it's a pretty important project from a recycling point of view. And as you can see in the table, uh, there are a number of other applications before um, council and the planning scheme. Uh, this site has significantly higher resource recovery um, targets and aspirations and the investment that's required to achieve that 40% recycling rate is demonstrated compared to the other applications in front of you. So recycling is an important part of, of this proposal, 450,000 tonnes diverted from landfill with 90% of the material going through some kind of process in order to achieve that recycling. One in every 12 tonnes of resource recovery in Queensland will be done at this site. Um, it's only 10% of the material, as the previous speakers have said, that goes directly into the landfill. And of course, the waste infrastructure report by the department only two years ago said that the state needed to build more construction and demolition sorting technology if we wanted to achieve the state's recycling targets. So we really need this kind of construction, demolition, putrescible and commercial sorting technology to be built in South East Queensland and, and this site uh, and this proposal is one of those. Thanks very much. Next slide. And, and it's an integrated project. Now, this is the important thing is that to, to do recycling nowadays, you need to have an integrated project where you're taking in streams in different, of different types, you're putting them through different technologies, diverting as much of that as you can from landfill uh, but you will always have a residual stream that needs to go to landfill to be disposed of safely, and, and this site provides that. Uh, obviously, it's not just another landfill because they're seeking 45% diversion with an aspiration of 60%. How you get from 45 to 60 is about targeting the types of waste you allow onto the site so that you target more recyclable streams that you can recover more material from. So 45% is, is the commitment with an aspiration to get to 60. Obviously, they will focus on the more viable commercial and construction and demolition streams. And I'll turn to the last point in my last comment that Jim made, which is the jobs generation. Uh, recycling generates about 9.2 jobs for every 10,000 tonnes of waste that we process, compared to two, 2.8 jobs in landfilling. So recycling, put simply, generates three times more jobs than landfilling a ton of waste. So you're always better to recycle it than landfill it. So it's important to do this project, not only from a resource recovery point of view, but it's a great jobs generator. And they're green jobs, continuous sustainable jobs. And this contributes to the circular economy. This is the kind of kit that we need across Australia, not just in South East Queensland, to build a circular economy so we can recover those materials and put them back into the productive economy. And this project is the leader in South East Queensland, without a doubt. Um, that's all I had to say, Jim, thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Our last presenter out of Sydney is Gavin Duane. Are you there, Gavin? Yes, I am, can you hear me? Yep, over to you, mate. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, panel members, Mayor, Executives, thank you for the opportunity to present. If I could have the next slide up, that would be helpful for me, please. Gavin Dwayne from Location IQ. I'm a, a need expert and give evidence in relation to need in the Queensland Planning and Environment Court. And usually need, as it's considered, covers three aspects. Economic, in terms of will the proposal be viable, is usually a key consideration. Uh, community, in terms of what's the net community benefit. And planning, and I say this from an economic point of view, not from a planner's point of view, is that is the site appropriate compared with other available sites economically? In terms of dealing with economic need, some of the key questions that are asked is, is there a willing and experienced operator? And you've seen uh, presentations tonight in relation to the extensive experience that Wanless has in operating resource recovery facilities and their commitment to continuing to operate those facilities. Is the process reliable? Um, the experience within the Sydney market shows that there's a proven technology process and there's a commitment to, continually do that, to that continually being improved. 
so that recycling rates increase over time. One of the key questions to answer in, in terms of the economic need is, is can you isolate one component of the project from the other? And the work undertaken by MRA Consulting shows that economic viability is placed in jeopardy if the recycling component only is, is approved. Um, and that's one of the key considerations in any facility as Mike has gone through. So the key economic benefits result in additional employment, which has been spoken about, but also maximising recycling rates through a dedicated modern facility. If you change to the next slide, please. The next issue is community need. Um, and the evidence of community need for increased recycling has shown through various state government strategies targeting greater recycling rates. The subject proposal has been shown is going to target waste that is currently not being recycled and can be recycled in much higher numbers. As shown, targeting a recycling rate of at least 45%. And there will be different recycling rates for different materials. But all material besides 10% is going to go through the recycling sheds with only residual waste being sent to landfill. And importantly, this landfill is going to go into an old mining void, allowing the site to be remediated over time. So those community need aspects cover strategies that the community is targeting through state government policies, remediating an old site and increasing recycling rates and doing that with a commitment to it going to recycling sheds, not to landfill. So moving on to planning need, again, I emphasise this from an economic perspective, not talking as a planner. The site sits within a regional business and industry investigation zone, so that gets a tick. The proposal will provide increased opportunity for recycling, as we've spoken about, to target in line with other levels in other states. There really is no other comparable facility in Queensland like the proposal. Do we need landfills? And I know that's a difficult question that's always spoken about, but landfills will continue to be required over the period of 2050, even on the basis of increasing to an 85% recovery rate. It still means 15% of waste over the next 30 years, if we get to 85% recovery, will still need to be landfilled. So what are the downsides? Next slide, please. Sorry, that's gone. Yeah, thank you. So we talk about sand economic planning, allowing for at least a 15 year Land, landfill capacity. We know it takes substantial time to approve these types of facilities as has been evidenced by the recent court case for a range of other landfills that have been proposed. Um, but it's important that just looking at capacity of landfill is not the only measure. Qualitative issues are also relevant when it comes to planning need. So in terms of reusing the mining void, an integrated facility is proposed. Um, complying with council's targets, makes that you need to understand those qualitative as well as quantitative factors when comparing this proposal with what are not really apples and oranges, is you're not comparing apples with apples if you're comparing this with other landfills as proposed. So although an excess supply of landfill capacity is not a good outcome, and that's not certainly something that might encourage the price of waste disposal to go down, it's important that landfills are attached to modern recycling centres such that you, you can get the benefits that have been spoken about in this outcome throughout this presentation. So in summary, Wanless Recycling Ebenezer is looking at maximising recycling waste. The site is, represents a logical location to provide those additional benefits for the Queensland market, has an experienced operator with other recycling parks with high recovery rates, the intention to be selective around the waste types and to increase recycling over time. And importantly, the ability to expand and incorporate uh, improved technology as the industry involves over time. And so they're the three key issues in terms of economic community and planning need that this proposal, in my view, shows that they tick those boxes. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, Dean was going to just say a few words at the end. Is Dean still there? I am, Jim. Can uh, everyone hear me this, at yeah, the moment? Yeah, okay. I don't want to take words out of your mouth as I did at the last bit, Dean. So over to you for a, a summary from yourself. Thanks, Jim. And, and thank you, everybody. Um, as you can see, a uh, highly experienced team that um, has been assembled to deliver this application. Um, 
you know, ex excellent. I, I'll only I'll only add and, and summarise the best I can, and that that is it's a totally compliant DA. Um, we've spoken about the site, uh, and, and it's it's a perfect location and site, actually the best I've ever seen. It'll create over the term of its of the, the complete project uh, thousands of jobs for this region. Um, and, and knowing that recycling does deliver in excess of three three jobs to those of landfill, it'll be at this stage will be two hundred million dollar investment, and with that will bring infrastructure to that Ebenezer area, promotes innovation investment in the region, uh, and I think we've dealt with the site in a in a sensible and sensitive way. Um, that's it's a great outcome for all for the community um, and all stakeholders. Um, not not to and not to leave out the the 66 hectares uh, that's being rehabilitated and preserved for habitat. Um, aligns perfectly with the council's circular economic uh, strategy, the circular economy goals. Uh, we've dealt with the odour issues in a, in a serious and effective manner, um, and. It's not a landfill fundamentally, it's a resource recovery centre and infrastructure at its core. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, I hope you've got a lot out of it. I welcome questions. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, we are a proud Queensland family business and we've got a proven track record of being responsible and getting things done. So, um, you know, we, we're, not, we're not asking for hope or a leap of faith, that's, that's proven. So uh, thanks again. Thanks very much, Dean. Let me just conclude with a couple of sentences. I went for a drive around Ripley the other day, and that's where all the noise, sorry, the odour complaints are coming from, and it's very clear that that's a problem. And it's a problem because of composting and sewerage sludge. This approval does not have any composting in it. It will not be taking any sewerage sludge and more importantly, everything will be processed in an air-controlled shed. Uh, there, and I think it's important to re-emphasise for the planners, we have applied for no relaxations. Often applications come in and there's relaxations here, here, here and there. There are no relaxations on this application. We comply with the plan. Uh, and I think... That's probably enough. Thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, Chairman and panel, Ma Mark, very much appreciate it. I don't know whether what you want to do. I know we've probably pushed into time a little bit. You want us to sit down and shut up? Yeah, we'll go on to the next slide. Excellent. Good. Uh, thanks, thanks, Chairman um, and others uh, from the Wanless team. Thank you uh, for your presentations this evening and providing that information to the participants that are both here present this evening and also online. Um, out, we've got a number of submitted presentations this evening as well, and I'd like to call up Cornelia Turney um, to provide your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we have my slide? Okay. Um, this is the area we're talking about. Now, the black one is where the original plant, you see, can see all the crosses in red there. They narrowed this back, not to get into the koala habitat. And we're now talking about the big landfill, which are gonna be in these greenish water areas. Now, they said they're um, following the TPLG. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you so much. And number two, and talking about rehabilitation. Now, the TPLG very clearly said that rehabilitation and mining void means filling the mining void involving only clean earthen materials. Now, clean earthen materials are brick, paper, ceramics, and concrete, and they're only on the size of 300 millimeters. Um, this comes actually from the Mining Act, because this is still an old mine, mine and it's still um, is under the Mining Act. Um, clean earthen material is um, earthen material with trace elements, and that was supposed to be mine spoiled. So we can go to the next one. Next slide. There's a clear distinction between landfill 
and um, rehabilitation in the TPLI um, under point 0.84 and 0.85. Landfill is the new disposed material such as waste, producible waste, organic waste, regulated building waste. That is a landfill. We are not talking about rehabilitating what they, they want to do. They want to build a landfill. Um, now we can go to the next one. Next slide. So under the mining lease, under the Mineral Resource Act, um, uh, 1989, um, 700, uh, 276 general conditions of mining. Each mining le le lease shall be subject to, and the point here is number C, condition that the holder must carry out improved improvement restoration for the mining lease. Restoration under the Mining Act includes rehabilitation and then restoration. They actually go one further. So again, they're talking about rehabilitation in the Mining Act. It's under the Mining Act, this, this lease still. Um, it's still a mining lease, and therefore they should be rehabilitating. The TLP definitely says that it's not rehabilitating. Next one. Um, so under the Environmental Protection Act 1994, um, 126D, requirement for proposed PLCP schedule, mining land has to be re rehabilitating. So again, putting it into mining void is not rehabilitating. Next slide. Um, well, they now have changed that. Originally, this was 50 meters above the ground, which they now figured out that they can't do that. So now they are apparently on top of the, um, not extending beyond the top. So next slide. Um, now, to give this application, uh, to, to allow this application, um, we can only do that or it can only be done under the TLPI um, where it can be clearly demonstrated with a high degree of certainty that as improvement that can be improved amenity, environment, and community outcomes that this is achieved. So it has to be an improvement. If it's not an improvement, it should not be um, approved. So next slide. Now, according to expert, we, we've been in the court, and the experts tell us that, um, that um, landfill, landfills of this magnitude, we heard, that the impact of landfills are leachate, landfill gases, road traffic, dust, noise, odor, risk of fire, and non-compliances. Let's go through them. Uh, next slide, please. Now, impact of odor. They were talking a lot about odors. Okay, you have your odor in your shed, but you're still putting the stuff in the landfill, and it's going to be creating odors. So it is not true that all the complaints came from just down from the composting. That is not true. They came from um, further up from Newcham as well. So there will be orders. We had 10,000 complaints, or 10,970 um, complaints um, about order. And this is not only from um, down at Swanbank, but it's from Newcham up, up that way as well. Um, we were told by the expert that we can expect eight fires a year from a landfill that goes into a void. Um, Clean Away has 82 fires in 11 years. They are an expert in apparently landfills as well. Next slide. Now, leachate is a massive problem. They're going under the, um, under the water table, um, under the groundwater table with their landfill. Um, it's a massive problem, apparently, in big, massive landfills like that to keep the level of groundwater, um, to keep the leachate um, at a level of 300 millimeters above the liner is impossible. We heard this from the big landfills. They were all over um, their 300 millimeters despite really hardly trying. Um, Bob Emerald told us that they have to um, pump the leachate for eternity. So it will affect our future generations. 
So you cannot hold this. You should not have a landfill in a mining void, especially not under the, under the water table. Now, leachate is full of PFAS. And CleanAway is very experienced. They have found that they have leachate. But they contaminated their whole ground with um, leachate, uh, with PFAS. So if they can't do it. Now, when, we, when I was talking to Rainless at the first um, time they had their um, community consultations on that day, I asked, what about the leachate? They looked at me with very blank faces. They had no idea that leeches and uh, that PFAS existed. Um, and they promised to read up about it. Now, they're supposedly running a um, facility down in Sydney. So what are they doing with their leachate? Very scary. Next slide, please. Now, a big thing is, of course, the water contamination. This landfill, they said, is supposed to last 60 years. And even if it's only 18 years, um, for the one they were pointing out, um, you have to add 30 years on top of that. Now, I was told by a mining and, uh, expert, Colin Donegan, that the life of a liner is about 30 years. After that, we cannot guarantee it. Now, who's going to guarantee that um, this will last even to the end of the landfill, let alone the 30 years after the closure? We also have unstable ground. There's mines underneath, which presents an even greater risk for liner breakage. Next slide, please. Um, another problem, of course, is that this landfill is connected to the Ibizina Creek and lies in a floodplain. According to the guidelines for landfill of the Department of Environment and Science, uh, landfills are supposed to be 100 meters away from a 100-year floodplain and should be constructed on stable ground, not on land above mining tunnels. And all this area is undermined. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, next slide. <laughs> That's away. So this is from the um, Queenstown Club. We have flood lines. Um, you can see the two big um, water holes there. Um, they are very close to it. Next slide. <coughs> we have groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, that includes the two big lakes there. Next slide. Um, there's the water courses. The big ones go directly in Evazina, as you can see there, um, in the Evazina Creek. Next slide. Um, there's um, um, there's um, areas of um, conservation significance, the Riverina spatial units, the whole area. Next slide. Um, aquatic, aquatic conservation assessment, non-riverine. You can see the green things there. Next slide. And of course, not to mention that all this is in the Great Artesian Water Resource Plain area, the whole mine. Next slide. And of course, I'm, I'm not sure why they said they're not building into the buffer zone, but to me, the slight um, orange one, that's the buffer zone looks to me like they're building into that. Next slide. Now, the state planning um, policy says that from 2070, states quite clearly that for the purpose of development, the benchmarks are livable community and water quality. Livable communities are um, defined as protective from environmental risk, air and water pollution, and minimal pollution levels. Next slide. Now, let's look at the recycling part. The truth is, I don't know why you call this recycling. Recycling, this is not recycling. This is the sorting place. Um, with, at the mo we were told that they can't recycle at the moment. So what they do, they sort, and then they send away somewhere. So that way, uh, they can only um, send away paper and steel at the moment, so they can't do anything else. So they will defer that for two years. They are 25 meters from the railway corridor by, at the bimodal, which will link to inland rail. <laughs> Just give me a second. Um, next one. So what that means, for two years we will not get waste. We will get waste into Ipswich from interstate to put into landfill here. The plan is obviously that rainless will use the inland rail to shift waste up here. This <coughs> means that we will get waste here and they will fill their landfill here. Once it's approved, what is the guarantee that we will actually even sort it? 
Next slide. IPSUS doesn't need this landfill. We have enough space for our producible waste and for non-producible waste. So we don't need a landfill. Um, we have enough for 44.4 years. This, of course, cannot be achieved if we get more landfills here and promote, promote the creation of, la of waste. Next slide. Cornelia, I'm going to have to wind you up there. Thank yeah. you. You're, okay. you're a bit over time, thanks. And just to, for fairness of your other speakers, okay. thank you. Sorry, if you want to, you got notes up there. No. Um, our next speaker is Rose Rosemary Thomason. I'm Rosemary Thomason, and I'm a uh, put in a submission to the uh, DA for one list. And I'm actually only got three points because Connie and I work together a lot. <laughs> okay, my first point is. Um, I thought this was a um, uh, mining lease held by ZMR and they've, they've got an EA or an ER still that sh was, became effective from 13, 13th of July 2018. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's still in existence. I don't think that's gone. I think it's still there. And that means once mining activities have ceased, it's supposed to be rehabilitated. And Connie's already said what that rehabilitation means. And that doesn't mean we fill it with waste to fill the void. Actually, the, what came out of there, the spoil, mining spoil, should go back in there. And the other thing, if, if it's going to be a landfill, it's going to take, like it says here, that it, this rehabilitation should be, the res, be done in an appropriate and a publicly expected and timely environmental outcome. It has to be timely, but I know it doesn't say what this timely is, what length it is, but I would assume within 10 years of mining decease that it should be completed, not 100 years' time. That's definitely not rehabilitation. If we're going to landfill it, then it's going to be operational for 30 years, and then you have to stick on the number of years it has to be managed after that. So um, it's definitely not being a rehabil rehabilitated. Um, now, the other thing is that the um, South East Queensland mayors, I've forgotten how many, but there's seven, seven councils that have come to an agreement that they're going to, they're heading for a cyclic economy, which does not mean that we go and put waste into a hole, because that's not recycling. That's filling up a hole with stuff that often can be used if there's, there's innovation there to do it. But they've, they want to see negligible waste by 2050. I've forgotten what it is, but I think it's 2030 we're supposed to be down to a certain level as well. And we're not going to achieve that if we've got, we're trying to give people the right to fill up big holes, because these holes won't be filled by 2050. And the problem is, when, when it runs out, when the waste to put in the hole runs out, they'll only have a hole half filled which creates more problems and just leaving a mining void there. And that's, that's because leachates have formed and everything else. Um, the other thing is that they, um, the um, uh, ZMR, for their um, re rehabilitation, they also had a um, financial assurance. I don't know how much that is, but that can't be handed back until total rehabilitation is completed. Therefore, in 100 years' time, whoever who owns the land then will get, them, get the, money, the rest of the money back. So that's a bit long to hold on to money just so to make sure there's going to be no environmental damage done in the meantime. So that's, I'm, I think that's a, a, bit out of the, a bit funny to do things like that. But anyway, um, now the... Connie's covered that one. The other thing is that the trees along Champion Way... Uh, will have to be removed if they're going to widen the road because I've, I've understood that they would have to widen Champion Road. Now, those trees, I've been told, were put there by the raceways as a buffer zone for noise and dust. If they remove those trees, even if they plant some more, they're not going to get to that height or size within <laughs> a few days. So if they remove those, that means that those raceways are then no longer compliant to their conditions. So that's a thing. Um, the, other, the other one is that swamp tea tree in, the, um, in that area. Now, there's a lot of swamp tea tree there. Now, that is actually... Um, 
under it's a I'll just get my little bit note here. The swamp tea tree is um, endangered under the Queensland Native Conservation Act of 1992 and should not be removed. Now that doesn't it it's that says it can't be removed for any reason, and you can't offset it. People say, uh, or development say, oh well, offset it. You cannot offset a something that's been living there for hundreds of years. Those trees are, are probably older than white man's been in the country. So you can't just go and offset it somewhere else. And if you offset it, what do you offset it with already a swamp tea tree forest or do you plant another one? You know, so that's, a, that's not to be touched. Um, now the, the last one is there, is the traffic. Now I've, having been in the courts, we weren't allowed to have anything to say about traffic. But this, I've been told, is they have to be using um, uh, Ipswich City Council Road, so it won't be the state government roads. And, and therefore, it's going to become an issue, the traffic. But the thing about it is, OK, they, they get approval to put so many trucks on, on there a, um, a day, but then they, they don't consider how are the trucks going to get there? They've got to come along state roads, don't they? And depending on where they're coming from, um, it's going to cause a lot of problems because the roads cannot take this amount of traffic. And then when something else happens, like if, uh, if a mining quarry opens up, there's more problems. So it becomes a cumulative effect. So traffic is definitely a problem. And even if they use the inland rail to bring their their rubbish from um, New South Wales or further afield, they've still got to put it on trucks to get it there, unless they're going to build the modal that can just offload it straight into their area. So trucks are going to be a problem no matter how they get it there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rosemary, for that presentation. Now next we have uh, Ursula and Gary. I'm not going to say a lot because um, Gary Duffy here has been representing us in court recently for the land track application and objection that we had. So because of my hours as a teacher, I have not been able to represent us and Gary kindly stood in as a proxy. As a member, he's going to continue that today. I just want to draw your attention to the top left-hand corner of that nice little slide so that you all understand what Wayne Liss is talking about. That is a community that is rural residential. You might as well call it urban because those are houses closely packed together. They're not separated by a great distance. They weren't expecting another dump area to go in there. So there are multiple dumps proposed and you've heard a lot of the reasons Gary's going to talk about some more why this will impact the community and why it will not only affect the community, the PFAS that was mentioned will affect everyone all the way to Ipswich and down to Moreton Bay because we know there are contaminated areas in Ipswich because people have been watering for years from the river and the PFAS is already leached into the river. There are signs down on the River Park Walk saying do not fish from this walk because the fish are contaminated with PFAS. So any extra water added to the site will only increase that contamination. So that's my high horse and my one point because I just wanted to add to Connie's point. And please, Gary, do go on for us. Uh, thank you, Ursula. Um, my name's Gary um, Duffy. Um, now, it's a wonderful presentation by Wanless here today. And uh, um, uh, one thing they're talking about is they're talking about recycling. They're talking about um, wanting to rehabilitate the, the site. Um, rehabilitation is covered quite clearly in an article which was written by Allens and Linklaters. Um, and I can hand it out to all the members here and hand it up. And it talks about recycling. Allens and Linklaters were, if those of you know, were the, um, were the legal counsel in the Cleanaway landfill. Uh, site but this here was never presented to them because it actually contradicted everything they talked about about rehabilitation of landfill sites. Rehabilitation of landfill site is a requirement under the Mineral Resources Act. It's not under town planning, it's under the Mineral Resources Act. It means that the Mineral Resources Act has total control over what happens on a mine site. 
as far as rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is then uh, on through the Mineral Resources Act, is then followed up by the TLPI, which stipulates clean soil only. And clean soil only from the Mine Act and Section 6A of the Mine Act says that mining license is granted that for the disposal of soil back into the site that was mined from the used to recover minerals from that site. So if you recover minerals and you have to take soil out, the only soil that can go back on that site is the soil you took out of that site, not something you can bring back in. Now, in, 2000 and, uh, in 2020, the Queensland Government um, has a Rehabilitation Commissioner Office and they established the Rehabilitation Commission Office. I haven't seen any one thing from Wanless on the Rehabilitation Commissioner's uh, report or anything about a Rehabilitation Commissioner's input into this application at all, nothing at all about the Rehabilitation Commissioner's Office input into this. Um, that seemed to have just been glossed over. Now, we've all just spent 48, 50 days in the Planning Environment Court in three of the biggest landfill um, uh, cases there are, and I can tell you that where they say about need, there is no need. We have enough landfill space for uh, the next 50 years plus, and if we project down to the, get to the recycling rates that we need, we probably got enough landfill space for the next 100 years, so the need is not there. It's certainly, um, and if they're talking about, uh, I, I noticed that they said that 90% of what comes into the site will um, go through a recycling phase and then it'll be 45% will be recycled. That's actually lower, that recycling level is lower than South Australia, right? That, if you take that 10% off the top and then the 45%, it's lower. So their proposal is nothing about recycling. It is actually a less um, recycling than South Australia. How can you say it's best practice when it's a less recycling than South Australia? The other thing that we want to touch on is that this landfill site is below the water table. It's below the groundwater table. Now we've seen, uh, now we've got a report there that um, Clean Away can't control their landfill, their, their leachate. So there, there's a condition on there, it's 300 mils. They're seven to nine metres above. They're supposed to have 300 mils, which is this much, leachate in the bottom. There's seven to nine metres. Um, then we have uh, um, uh, BMI, can't control their landfill, can't control their leachate at all. And we also have Ramondas. You know how much Ramondas? 30 mil, 300 mils of leachate? They're 38 metres. They cannot control it because it's in the, in the um, below the groundwater table. They're just getting too much water. They cannot pump out their leachate quick enough for, the, for what's accumulating in their site. So how can um, Mr Wanless come along and see a landfill site that's absolutely totally full of water now thinking that he can drain it out and then control the water in there. It's never, ever, ever going to happen. So no matter what condition you put on that, they'd have to pump it for eternity. And we're talking eternity, thousands of years. They'd have to have pumps on their pumping water. What are they going to do with that leachate for thousands of years while they're pumping it? They, they just cannot get rid of it. Now, we've spent a lot of time in this planning environment court and we've listened to hundreds of experts, I, I think probably not hundreds but close to, of expert witness statements. We've cross-examined them and we found out that these landfills in, in uh, places who are, uh, under the groundwater are not permitted anywhere else in the country. They actually stopped them in Victoria because you're not allowed to build in there. Queensland Government in, um, has just put through that you are... Uh, any landfill void that's in a, in a, um, uh, in 2019, Queensland Government introduced a requirement that progress and rehabilitation closure plans, which must specify milestones and rehabilitation and progressive rehabilitation subject to ongoing focus of across Australian jurisdictions, that you cannot now in Queensland ha have an open void 
in a floodplain. So these sites here are illegal to start with. There are open voids in the floodplain. Now, if Mr Wanless somehow reaches 90% re uh, recovery rate, he is never going to fill that void. What happens is you've got a void that's half filled that ends up being filled with water because they go broke. Now, this site here, we know that in 2012, there's a $54 million project on it. It went bankrupt and we left with the void. We know that it comes through and there's been heaps of people. There's a Japanese company come in. They were going to mine it out and rehabilitate it. They pulled out. They went away. It's uneconomical. So everything has been wrong with this. The company has an obligation to its mining lease and uh, it needs to rehabilitate it. Just to give you some facts, um, th there are at least 50,000 mines with legacy environmental issues in Australia. 50,000 mines. 200 Australian mines are projected to close in the next 10 years. So where we talk about needs and voids, 200 mines are projected to close in the next 10 years. Approximately 75% of the mine closures uh, are unplanned and premature. Less than 30 mines in all of Australia have achieved complete closure and re, re, uh, relinquishment back to uh, a stable state. This is why we have a rehabilitation commissioner. Not some, uh, we don't need companies that are going to come in and fill up mining voids with waste and it's not, wanted, not needed and we've got to think that it's on the Clarence Morton Basin which it, uh, goes all the way down past Grafton so if we put PFAS in here, farmers down in New South Wales are going to get PFAS on their farms. They're going to, in their bull water, they're going to have PFAS running through their bull water. And the Clarence Morton Basin is the only sub-basin of the Great Artesian Basin. So how much do we want to leave this legacy for generation intergenerational equity to come that intergenerational in the future are going to be paying for the mess that we leave them out of the voids that we left in this state? We don't need it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ursula. Thanks, Gary. Ursula, did you want to say a quick... I wasn't even sure if I introduced our community group or not. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, please do. Just so, so we're the Rosewood District Protection Organisation. So we're named that because we were involved against a fight um, with New Hope many years ago and it's grown from there. So we had always thought that our community organisation would wind up at some stage. Um, unfortunately, it's now gone from fighting the miners, putting large holes in the ground directly behind Rosewood High School to the mines spreading all the way around Willow Bank and Amberley and becoming dump sites. So rather than those of us who've been doing this fight for 20 years, and that's not me, I came in just after that, um, some of those members are getting very tired of that continuing battle with the miners and the developers and those people who want to do things to our whole local area that are inappropriate for development. And we all know it, the members of the community are here and all those that represent our two groups, Rosewood and District, which incorporates everyone who joins us basically, and the direct Willow Bank community who've been there for many years, um, getting very tired of these fights. So we would really appreciate if you say no to this inappropriate development for the whole of Queensland and New South Wales, as was mentioned. So we would really appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, next presenter is George. George Hatch Hatchman. Thank, Thank you, George. You. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know me, my name is George Hatchman. I'm not at the moment, I've retired, but I was uh, 30 years the president of the Willow Bank Area Residence Group. I uh, have an understanding of the um, Willow Bank Area. I actually own land, well, was, my apologies, I was going to refer to that other slide you had. Um, I own land in, in the area, this is my property there, and uh, I was taken to the, the mining court to have my land resumed by um, Ida Mitsu way back in the late 1998 or so to allow for buffer for the mining. I have witnessed the major flooding through there because it came close to our, our land. So um, also I'm, I've got a, quite a knowledge of the history. Uh, and when Ipswich amalgamated with the Morton Shire Council, uh, the Ipswich City Council asked myself 
to map out um, the future, not like Caldy, but the new suburb of Willowbank. So I, I studied the demographics and the history and came up with a boundary line. My background is I was Air Force for uh, 50 years. Uh, Mayor Theresa would know what I did, but I was uh, last real duty was uh, in charge of the F-11 Technical Training School. And I was also for a time the RAP Authority on, on aircrew breathing gases and their cryo associated cryogenic liquids, and that's in production um, quality and the measurements. So I have a good understanding of the sciences of gases and, and uh, uh, those other elements. Um, Basically, I suppose, where I come from here is um, being the um, president of the Willowbank Area Group, I've been the stellar white of maintaining our social environmental amenity. That doesn't mean we're greenies. We live in an area, a modern world, that's uh, it's changing. We have an Air Force base, we have mining activities of the past, uh, there's a raceway, etc. But all these are done in balance. And when you're in the community, and I just noticed that Dean back there said um, yeah, this is a perfect location, well, goodness sake, uh, nothing's mentioned about the Willow Bank community, the amenities on us. This is our backyard. And, I, and we're the people that should have a say in what goes on. And, and when it comes to that, um, before we go into the next slide, uh, when the ML4712 was established, and they have what they call a poop, it's a plan of operations. Under those operations, there was community consultation. And this said that a part of that was... Um, uh, the consultation was the development of stable post-mining landforms for appropriate rehabilitation methods as described in this poop, which gone on and explained what, what Coney and others have explained. It also says under that, investigation into alternate beneficial mining land uses. And that was to be done in association with our community. Those words never came or no information to get discussed that. So it, it evolved. Um, I originally was involved with uh, ML5100, it, it morphed into 4712, and I walked the lands with the, 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 the lands it was from eons of years with the creek systems with the previous mining manager uh, by Frank Rendridge, and the undertaking of me was post mining, this would be rehabilitated to the landform that was, creeks and that, and that'll be within say 30 years. Well, because 30 years has passed, we've still got this mess. And I hear the promises of the land track uh, overside that uh, from Jeeva Pilly, from New Hope, that be, was going to be repatriated to um, natural landforms and still the voids, and then we'll sell it for dumps too. So, as far as projecting that in 18 years that will return back to a natural landform, uh, I don't believe that because no government has supported the ideals of what was agreed to. Cause when a mining application is proved, that's proved through Queensland State Government. And that's really a voice on our people to say that we're doing a contract with you people, the community, to say that part of this mining um, lease uh, and the application uh, uh, approvals is that there are certain conditions. One of those is rehabilitation. And those guidelines have never been met. If the Queensland Government, no matter what party, had been true to its form, there would have been a continuing um, uh, monitoring of the mining resource and as each void was was worked it should have been rehabilitated as they what those practices never happened so the guarantees that we have as a community from our governments just don't come into play so we have a lot of credibility but given that um, I found Dean a very likeable young lad I've spoken to him on the phone and look he's got he's an entrepreneur he's got good ideas the sensible ones and when those first uh, put up to us as a community of that rehab of that with a land uh, uh, with a uh, recycling park uh, could we just go to that side that uh, that uh, one was put forward now keep going keep going whoops there should be one missing way back way back the one before that and nevertheless it's 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 uh, missing from there never mind that hasn't made the slide group but basically uh, I have the uh, particular document here. I'll just flash around for consideration so you may know what I want about. But, but it was a promo, it was done over the Rosewood, and it was all about the exciting aspects of recycling park and the buildings and everything that was quoted here. And look, as a community, we thought, well, that's not a bad idea. You know, uh, big box buildings down there, decreetly played, the fire parks. But the concept of a large landfill associated with that was never really surfaced. That came along the way. We really found that the economics of the recycling park was such that it could only be buoyed by a, a landfill void. Well, heavens, you know, 
what is it? A recycling park or a landfill? That, they, that, that never came clear to us. So while we supported the concept of recycling park, we never would have recycled, we approved the concept of a, land, a void. Now, going back generation before, because we had the residents of ML5100, which morphed into tea tree. Now, that didn't come easy to our community. When that was first fostered, our community was against it. But, but in, in, in trueness to their particular volition to, to work in the community, that particular company, which was Collex, worked with this community for two years until they got all the resolutions sorted out. Then they put their DA in. This company put a DA in, put it on the 19th of December for us to put objections in within 14 days on the verge of Christmas. Now, can you say that's community spirit? That's company greed for business at the expense of the community, and, and I found that arrogance. The other issue, the, there's, um, if we go, just flash up one of those slides, and I'll just go through that. Uh, I saw one of the, uh, that particular, go back here. Now, when we talk about jobs, if we look into this prediction back in 2003, this was back when the mining was supposed to happen and what was going to happen with this rehab plan, that area had a jobs prediction of 94,000 people. Now, we're talking now of probably 400 people. There's a big difference. That was what that was supposed to provide when the mining was finished and supposed to be rehabilitated and, uh, and we're suddenly descaling to... Um, Jobs, people keep on talking jobs, but the manifestation of jobs is not what was predicted if that had been rehabilitated to correct um, uh, amenity post mining. Can we have the next slide? Also, I'll just point out here, this is Alvillo Van Township. Now, we're, we're located central to a lot of this particular mining activity. So suddenly there's uh, a void from Jeeva Kilby, there's the ML5100, there's the ML4712, and the average, these companies were, were, were given the opportunity and, and the direction to rehabilitate. None of these voids have done that. And the governance, I said, has been lacked in ensuring this activity. So suddenly there's a hole in the ground. Let's go shopping. You know? <laughs> that would make a good dump site. Think of the community around it. What are we got? Where's their consideration? That is never mentioned. It's all about community, but they're talking about the community of South East Queensland. And, and I said, I, I like Dean. He's a nice bloke. He's, he's got family values, etc. But when I've gauged him in the phone, I've said to Dean, these mining boys here, do you have any intent on shipping stuff up in New South Wales? Dean has never given me an assurance on that. No. So, so I'll just make that point. Um, uh, following slide. A lot of issues have been mentioned about the the uh, the needs, etc. But and all those are state issue. I took this photograph yesterday morning. Now this is the Cunningham Highway, any working day of the week, and that gives you an idea. There's the two two kilometre backup traffic, and it goes back the other way up the highway every morning. This highway needs development before any considerations for further industrial or. Um, other, other uh, commercial activity of great nature of uh, vehicle movements needs to be approved. I personally received a phone call from the Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, uh, Malcolm McCormick, to say that he was going to give $170 million to the uh, Queensland State Government if they could match it to duplicate this Cunningham Highway to allow egress to the basin, track south and, and the commerce to the area. The State Government have taken that $170 million, didn't match it, and they're spending on other issues of maintenance throughout the area. So we're never going to get that duplication of the highway. Yet, if this goes ahead, they'll expect to receive $75 a tonne for every bit of waste that's trucked to any of the landfill facilities and not make a co contribution back to the communities affected. So I, I, I can see, keep on sort of saying but, uh, issues, but, but I'm talking from the heart of a resident that lives in this area. And the negatives that we see are the effect on our social and environmental ability without the consideration of the companies involved. Sure enough, it's, it, it's, it's a great enterprise. I can, see, I can see dollars, but I just like to see that they think of community. I would say that none of the executives of Wanless will choose to build their home and reside in Willowbank. And that's the mark of it. If they've got faith in this, 
They're, they're executives. The people who work there should all be living in close, close co company to where they work. I bet that doesn't happen. So, so it, it's an emotional outburst for me, but as I said, I speak for the community and I'm not against development, but that development has to be d done in conjunction with community, respect community, uh, lifestyles and land values. You know, to be surrounded by possibly three landfill facilities, you're going to say that Willowbank's a nice place to live? People are going to look at that's that's a dump area. Now, if you even drop 5% of our land values and look at the overall uh, values of property in the way of Willowbank, that would be something like 20, 30 million dollars have gone out of our property values. Who's going to redress that? So while there's good merit in recycling, um, the actual greater aspect of it turning into a utilising as a land for a, a fill site, when we have it a pre-existing, so one, so it's not an MB, not in our backyard, because we already have a, a mining facility, but that's our contribution to community. If there's got to be other facilities, then they need to look at other facilities around the state. There's railway trains that go back to the coal mines west, go back empty. There's, there's cheap ability to, to move product and, and relocate elsewhere. But Willow Bank's made our commitment. We've got our, our commitment to this particular industry and we've got our social amenity and our environment considerations. Albeit, the recycling plant, that's within the scope of what we accept, but, but not additional land void here, one out to west as a land track, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you. closing that, uh, I'd like to say thank you for having this opportunity. It's an emotional burst from me, but but it's our community that we stand for, and that's the community we protect. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, George. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is Richard Taylor from Tea Tree Bioenergy. Thanks, Richard. It's good to take that off. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Richard Taylor. I'm a general manager with JJ Richards, and we are partners with Veolia in the tea tree bioenergy facility. Now, I wanted to spend most of my time in this presentation, I guess, justifying why we felt uh, as if we should make a submission against this development, uh, because I want you to be assured that this is not a commercial competitor type objection. Uh, I'll give you the reasons for that. But look, before, before I get into that, uh, I just want to make some observations from the, the presentation earlier from, uh, from the Wanless delegate. Um, it talks about, uh, what should I say, the, uh, the original submission or the original uh, propaganda talked about recycling. And uh, it was mostly about recycling. It was actually a, a two-page uh, uh, editorial or, or editorial in the uh, Courier Mail, and that, uh, I don't think that mentioned landfill once. But when we had a, actually had a look at the, uh, the submission, as you would as a, uh, as a neighbour to that site, we saw that most of the submission was all about landfill. Uh, and not only was it all about landfill, uh, it was talking about putrescible waste being included too. Now we've heard from the delegates today that uh, putrescible waste will all be handled in a negative pressure building but there's no composting on the site. So I wonder what, what actually is happening to that putrescible waste if it's not been, how has it been recycled? It's not clear. And that brings me to the point about uh, our confusion and part of the reason why we decided to submit is that uh, we weren't really sure what was going on next door. It looked like a recycling facility, but it felt like a landfill. In terms of, um, uh, where are we? Oh yeah, the other thing is with the, uh, the putrescible element uh, and the talk about the biofilters, we couldn't see any of that element in the, uh, in the actual submission. So that, that might be a new thing that's come along. And the tailings dams which are shown on here are still requiring landfill access. We're not really sure what's happened to those now either. So I think that the bottom line or the fundamental thing uh, as we stand here today is that we're not actually sure what the, uh, the panel would be recommending on, you know, what is it? What is the application now? Uh, the delegates talked about recycling only is not viable. But most of the material that we receive at, uh, at Tea Tree has come from a recycling plant. We receive a lot of residual waste. You know, the, the Tea Tree is actually too far out of the main conurbation areas to get a lot of small traffic, the skip trucks, the small sort of tipper trucks. 
you know, they're going into recycling facilities and transfer stations in Brisbane and in, in uh, bigger areas. And there they're doing some recycling. They're pulling out the steel, they're pulling out concrete. They're recycling as much as they can because they don't want to send it to a landfill and pay a landfill levy. So they're incentivized to recycle. This application with its uh, uh, integrated landfill development, where, where's their incentive to, uh, to recycle if they've got the hole next door? So where does tea tree fit into all this? Well, look, we, as I said, it's not a, uh, it's not a competitive objection. Uh, the market is not local for waste management in southeast Queensland, it's regional. You know, we're as much affected by a new landfill development in Brisbane or Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast as we are in, in Ipswich. So I just want to make that point. But, you know, we have a place in this area and, uh, you know, we've, we've worked hard to develop our social licence to operate. And, uh, you know, I met George many years ago when I was in the wandless position and we were facing uh, criticism and scrut uh, scrutiny on what our application was. Uh, as George said, we spent two years working through those issues. And these are a few other things that we achieved. Um, we, we continue to support a royalty-based community contribution, which has funded community projects in the environmental, heritage and social fields across Ipswich. More than $3 million has been contributed to date. It's a win for Ipswich City Council and the community and tea tree. We operate an effective bird management plan and continue to fund the most comprehensive IBIS population study in Australia. And that's all in the protection of the Ambly Air Base. You know, it was a main concern of the air base back in the day when tea tree was being permitted. How are we going to manage these birds? You know, we're surprised that the, uh, the wandless application hasn't covered that issue. Uh, I don't think they employed a, a wildlife expert to look at not only the, uh, uh, the putrescible waste that they're going to take into this facility, but also the, the, the impact or the cumulative impacts. And how does it affect tea tree's bird management plan, which involves a monthly survey of not just the tea tree facility, but every other landfill in, Ips in, uh, in the Ipswich area, plus roosting sites, breeding sites, road transects. We're doing a regional population study to prove that tea tree has no adverse effect on the, uh, the, the high-risk bird populations in Ipswich. How does this affect our place with that, uh, that ongoing project? Um, even the name tea tree came through community consultation. We were very clear that we didn't want to have any sort of negative connotations of, uh, of waste management being reflected on Willow Bank. That's where Tea Tree came from. And finally, and it's interesting that you showed that slide with the, the traffic, George, because uh, I remember back in uh, the early 2000s when the raceway opened and uh, the very first B8 um, event, I think, that they held there, the, the, the cars were backed up just about all the way to Ipswich. And Tea Tree funded that intersection. So the intersection of Champions Way with the deceleration lane and acceleration, Tea Tree did that. Before we got the DA approved, it was all part of social license to operate and a win-win for the community we operate in. It's interesting that George used the word balance because that's what I've used here. That's how I see Tea Tree's position in the, uh, in the community, is that we've reached a balance and accommodation. The, the impacts and benefits are in harmony with the community and what we're worried about with this development is how it affects that balance. Uh, the the wanless development, in particular the landfills, intersects with the same geology, it's in the same mining sequences, uh, it's in the same groundwater, in the same surface water, in the same air shed. Um, all those things are of great concern to us as to how it affects our position. Now, you know, why, don't, why aren't we prepared just to leave it to the authorities to, uh, uh, to deal with that? Well, the reason is we don't trust the process. This is the regulatory uh, strategy uh, of the Queensland Government. It was introduced by the, uh, the Newman Government back in about 2013 and it's still on the website today. I printed this off the website yesterday and I'll read it out verbatim. This is on page 8. It says, Information received by the department as part of an application will be accepted at face value. Except for obvious errors or omissions, the department will not check the accuracy or sufficiency of information provided by an applicant. <laughs> exactly. And that's why, you know, to me that explains a lot of the problems that uh, places like Swanbanks have. Other parts of Queensland that have been affected by 
recent developments that don't pass muster is because the Department of Environment, and they assure me that they don't follow this to the word anymore, but uh, for a while they, they weren't looking at the stuff, they weren't reading it. And therefore we engaged our uh, consultant engineers and they, they engaged with uh, uh, sub-consultants and we did a very thorough assessment of the application and it, and it was found wanting. Um, it, it isn't easy. I think one of the things that uh, uh, one of the um, one list delegates said was that uh, it's a complicated application. Well, it is, and it's a complicated geology, and uh, the landfill needs a lot of work. And just, just talking about putting in landfills into those tailings dams, we were just astounded that you, you can't just brush it over that stuff. You've got to do it. It's hard. It's difficult. And anyway, that may have gone by now. Um, so we did make a submission. It, the original submission was 106 pages. Uh, it covered 20 key grounds for objection, and it was supported by six detailed specialist reviews. Uh, that covered things like ecological, air, noise, and wildlife management, traffic review, and engineering reviews. Uh, we made a further six supplementary submissions as the information requests went out and information came back in. And we I guess concluded at the end of the day that uh, the whole process had been corrupted to the fact that you can't, it's not coherent anymore. Uh, new information came in, it, they didn't go back and, uh, and repair the old documents to make it coherent. So I'm not sure what's on the table. I suspect that uh, landfill is a primary objective of the submission and I'd be recommending that the panel refuse or recommend that the, uh, the application be refused. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> okay. Um, that wraps up the formal presentations that were scheduled this evening on the agenda that you have in front of you. Um, in, in terms of a closing, uh, look, there's been a number of uh, concerns and issues and benefits etc from both sides that have been presented this evening and I think uh, at the end of the day if your mayor and councillors are present this evening as well as officers from council so I think that's some valuable information that that has come come to light not just through the the, the DA process in writing but it's good to have that uh, those personal views and in, in person presented this evening and I think the panel process has provided that opportunity for you participating. So on behalf of the Mayor and Councillors and the Ipswich City Council, I'd like to uh, thank you for participating and also for those people that are attending online this evening. Um, uh, to all the uh, presenters, thank you for taking the time and effort and preparation in presenting your views this evening. Uh, I think that's helped certainly the panel, that uh, Mark and I. Uh, look, from this, from this point, uh, the panel will consider and deliberate further. Uh, we will then present a independent and separate report to the General Manager of Planning at Council, and that then gets considered and deliberated as part of Council's normal uh, decision-making process, and that will be going to Council, as I understand, sometime in September at this point in time. Well, apart from that, um, Thank you again for attending this evening. Safe travels home. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap up the panel uh, panel's uh, proceedings this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>